Okay, I uh, grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I was born not too far from where this apartment is. Both my parents uh, came over after the war. They were survivors of the Nazi Holocaust. They met and married in a DP displaced people's camp in Austria. And they came over in the late 1940s. Uh, they were pretty modest working people. My father was a, form, a uh, factory worker. Eventually he moved up to be a foreman. My mother raised the three children and then when we got to late grade school she began to work as a bookkeeper. Uh, she had a very good education before the war. She was uh, studying mathematics at Warsaw University when the war broke out. And my parents were I'd say I came from a political home. Uh, we read the newspapers, uh, watched the, they didn't have many talking head shows back then, but we watched, I uh, remember, we watched Meet the Press. Uh, but most importantly, politics was always dinner table conversation. Uh, most vividly, of course, during my years growing up was the war in Vietnam. Uh, also the Civil Rights Movement, uh, and they had their opinions about Israel and Palestine, though I don't think we talked about it. This Palestine back then was more Israel and the Arabs, and they were uh, plainly sympathetic to the uh, injustices that were being inflicted on the Palestinians. I had vague, vague knowledge of the topic, sort of like what every good leftist should know about the Israel-Palestine conflict. I pretty much knew uh, up until the early 1980s. Uh, during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in June 1982, I began to get publicly involved in the conflict. And uh, I then, I was at that point, uh, what's called, I think, ABD is the term, all but dissertation. I had finished all my graduate coursework, but couldn't come up with a dissertation topic. And uh, in the course of the um, Israel in invasion of Lebanon, uh, I joined a group, it was called Jews Against the Israeli Massacre in Lebanon. We weren't referring then to Sabra and Shatila, we were referring to just to the general carnage of the Israeli invasion. And one of the topics that sort of divided the group was taking a position on what was called Zionism. I didn't really know much about Zionism and I, didn't want, I don't believe in taking positions in anything unless you really understand what you're talking about. I'm not too much into sloganeering. And so I uh, <clears throat> sat down and started to read in the topic and I read so much at some point, I said, well, why not just turn this into a doctoral dissertation? So I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the theory of Zionism. Uh, so at this point, I had an intellectual connection with the topic. I had a political connection with the topic since I was involved publicly on the Israeli invasion. And given that I'm Jewish and my family background, and we're talking about what claims to be a Jewish state or a state which speaks in the name of the Jewish people. I had a personal connection with it. Uh, so uh, since there was like a confluence of the personal, the political, and the intellectual, it was almost inevitable that it would uh, come to preoccupy a large part of my uh, life. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1995, I wrote uh, is Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict, which is basically a collection of essays I had written over a fairly long period. Uh, the first in 1984 on a book called From Time Immemorial by somebody 
uh, named Joan Peters. It's unclear whether she actually wrote the book. Not so important. Uh, and that book purported that Palestine was empty before the Jews came. The Jews came, made it the desert bloom, and then all these Arabs from neighboring states surreptitiously entered Palestine to take advantage of the new economic opportunities and then pretended to be Palestinians. So the core of the book is there is no real Palestinian question because the Palestinians are all a fake. Uh, and the book received uh, accolades across the spectrum of American arts and letters uh, Saul Bellow, the Nobel Laureate, Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Laureate, Barbara Tuckman and Lucy DeWittowich, the historians. Uh, there was quite an uh, impressive array of uh, characters endorsing the book. And uh, for reasons not worth going into now, I did a fairly detailed analysis of the book uh, to demonstrate that the whole book was a fraud. It was a complete hoax. And... Uh, I made my little name from exposing the Joan Peters hoax actually just about 20 years ago this past month. And I wrote subsequent investigations of various mainstream claims about the Israel-Palestine conflict, about the June 67 war, the October 1973 war, about <laughs> the origins of the refugees and so forth. Uh, basically, you can call it forensic scholarship. I looked at the claims that were made, I looked at the supporting data, and I uh, reached conclusions about whether or not this scholarship, more often not, whether or not this scholarship was giving you an accurate picture of what actually happened. Um, then after that, I wrote a book uh, entitled The Rise and Fall of Palestine, a personal account of the Intifada years. And basically, I went back every summer during the first Intifada uh, from 1988 to 95 and stayed with a couple of families. One, a Christian Palestinian family from a little village outside Bethlehem called Beit Sahur, and then a or a Palestinian Muslim refugee family from Fawar camp outside Hebron. I would shuttle between these two families, both of whom I became personally um, connected with, and I wrote basically a, an account of the first intifada as seen through their eyes. Uh, after that, I wrote a couple of books on the Nazi Holocaust, one in which I examined the claims of uh, Daniel Goldhagen in his book, Hitler's Willing Executioners. Uh, basically, his thesis was, since the beginning of time, all the Germans wanted to murder the Jews. Uh, along came Hitler, he gave them the green light, and finally they got to do what they wanted to do for millennia. Kind of a lunatic book, uh, of course, it's lunatic theses like that that get uh, raves in the United States. So it was a big national bestseller. And basically I said the, the whole book was nonsense. Uh, after that, I wrote a book uh, entitled The Holocaust Industry, which looked at the way the Holocaust is exploited for political and financial gain by American Jewish elites. And right now I'm work working on a book on what's called the new anti-Semitism, which I basically claim is uh, an orchestrated extravaganza having very little to do with reality. And the second half of the book deals with the uh, politics of Alan Dershowitz of Harvard. Can you outline any um, problems you've had in being able to work um, 
publish, um, get your voice across in various media, um, do it be um, somewhat you know, uh, controversial topics and, and interesting. Well, as a matter of uh, principle and honor, I never complain in public. Uh, I save complaints for my friends uh, who have to bear with them on a daily, sometimes an hourly basis. But I don't think it's... Uh, mm. uh, okay, I won't uh, ask you about any specifics, but... No, I'll, I'll answer your question. Uh, we're, we're assuming? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't think it's proper to complain about one's life in public, but I can give you uh, a kind of political answer. Let's take the case of the Holocaust industry. The Holocaust industry sold worldwide, now I would estimate about a quarter of a million copies, perhaps even more. It was an international bestseller. It's been translated now into 20 different languages, a pretty hefty sum. Uh, it was on the bestseller list, the top 10 bestseller lists in countries as diverse as Brazil and Italy. It was on the Der Spiegel bestseller list, that's the major one in Europe, for seven months. Uh, one, number one or number two. Well, what happened to the book in the United States? In the United States, I was not on one television program, no interview, apart from the alternative radio program, Democracy Now! I was not on one radio program, not one interview. Not one radio, in, not one television interview, not one radio interview. Absolute, across the board, silence. Uh, the New York Times ran a full page review in the New York Times Sunday Book Review, uh, which consisted of a barrage of ad hominem attacks on me. And basically, it did its job. Uh, you have to understand that the New York Times book review serves basically two functions. Number one, uh, it's the review that librarians look at across the country to decide what books to order for their collections. So one New York Times book review calling the author anti-Semite and this and that means you've just killed all library orders. The second function of the New York Times book review is it tells second and third tier papers which books to review. So it won't determine what the Washington Post reviews, it won't determine what the LA Times reviews, it won't determine what the Boston Globe reviews, but the second and third tier you know, even things like Chicago Tribune, which is large, um, it will tell all those papers which books to review, which books are not important, and which books are taboo. Mine was a taboo. So, apart from, I would say, major reviews in the Times and the Washington Post and so forth, those reviews sent out the signal this is anti-Jewish, don't review it. And there were no reviews, nothing. What did uh, the Post say? The same uh, about the same. It was a guy uh, from, I think, Stanford. They all said the same thing. The guy is a nut, obviously uh, anti-Semite, even if he's Jewish. Everything he says is lunatic. Uh, let's move on. Uh, you know, things along those lines. Um, so... Uh, that's how you kill books in the United uh, States. Did, have you been uh, abroad to uh, Well, look, I was, you know? I was in the UK. Uh, my book was excerpted in The Guardian, two, uh, two huge excerpts from The Guardian. It was reviewed in every paper in England. I was in at least 
at least 10 BBC programs. I was on all the television programs, all the major television programs. It was a huge event. It was a huge event. In Germany, uh, there's just no words to describe. It was also a huge event in Germany. As it was in Italy, I never went to Brazil. I didn't have the time. Brazil, uh, just the United States. Uh, very efficient means of, of controlling what you can and can't hear. Uh, we want to speak about um, having to leave uh, teaching in New York to go no. to Chicago. How about, do uh, you have any way of knowing how far you are up on the, on the enemy's list, uh, the various Jewish enemies list? Any, ever get any feedback from somebody that no, you're number I, I, one or you're number five? I have no insights into the machinations of the uh, mainstream Jewish uh, organizations. I don't know much about them. I just know them from what they write, and that's quite sufficient for me. Uh, you can't really, uh, I don't know how much is coordinated, how much is orchestrated, how much it's the independent initiative of a thug here and a hoodlum there. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, you relate any of the personal encounters and activities that you had with these two families when you were memorable incidents mm -hmm. or relationships, you know, close relationships that well, you uh, made? Uh, I became quite close to both families. The family in Beit Sahur, uh, called the Barhan family, and the family in um, uh, Hebron is the Musa Abu Heshesh. That's him over here, that's Musa. And that's Nidal and Musa together. Um, I, I became quite close to them. The only way I can convey to a audience that doesn't know me and can't possibly get to know me from a brief comment in a video, the depth of my feeling for them is I recall quite vividly that when my, my parents passed away within a couple of months, within a few months of each other, uh, my father first and my mother second, and I do vividly recall that when they passed away, of course the question, one of the questions is, who do you tell? And among the, you know, four or five people, I immediately wanted to inform were my friends Musa and Nidal to tell them my parents had died. Do you, uh, do you still communicate with them? Yeah, I, uh, Nidal, her, one of her daughters is getting married in August. And of, of course, I was invited to the wedding, but I won't be able to make it. And uh, which reminds me, I have to send a little gift. I forgot that. <laughs> and um, Musa, I talked to once every two weeks, but his phone is so much out of order, it's hard to keep up with him. Which village is he in? He's from Fawar camp in, uh, outside Hebron. Hebron is the, the city that has a Jewish uh, yeah, in downtown. Yeah, they have uh, between two and four hundred uh, Jewish lunatics, mostly from where I live now in Brooklyn, uh, Michigan, the Jews who uh, decide they're going to recreate the Alamo in Hebron. Uh, are you familiar with uh, the various, the, let's say, the characteristics or the personalities of, of various settlements? Uh, no, I have no, I only passed through a couple of settlements uh, because it was a shorter route to where I had to go. 
I forgot which settlement I passed through. I think it was Kiryat Arba, because I was going to Hebron. But apart from that, I never go to the settlements. Now, uh, do you uh, ask for papers and so forth by the uh, security? I have no problem. I've not had problems going in and out. You know, that's very, uh, it's very, um, what's the serendipitous? Uh, I can have wonderful luck and then once they'll turn me around. It's hard to predict. So, uh, nice. so what, how kind of, uh, what is their reception for us, say, an American Jew kind of poking their, their nose around? They, it, they all dep- it all depends on uh, how tense the moment is when you're there, and a lot of it, I think, is local decisions. I don't think a lot. I don't think a lot of it is t- uh, decided in an office. Local commander. Yeah, how he, how he or even a local soldier, just yeah. the, uh, his mood. Have you uh, any feeling for, uh, let's say, in, in the army in general? radiation of uh, hatred or dis- uh, despising of, of the Arabs? I don't know anything about the army. I mean, look, the whole environment is very corrupting, and it's easy to get intoxicated on power there. You're an 18-year-old kid. Your hormones are raging. You get to lord it over everyone around you. They're all, you decide their fate. You can make people stand at a roadblock uh, for four hours or five hours. You can humiliate and degrade people as you choose. Uh, You can make them take off their clothes. You can make them crawl on the floor. You can make them bark like a dog. You can do whatever you want. And, uh, you know, most people, that's human nature, that kind of power corrupts most people, and then you had two added layers, just the sheer inequity in the distribution of power, uh, the sheer lawlessness, and then on top of that you have a deeply inbred um, racism, uh, which is going to be very corrupting too when the power is so, the disproportion power is so huge. And then on top of that, you have the anger uh, at the suicide bombings. Uh, so when you compound all of that, you get a very lethal brew, and uh, people there are very nasty. Any sense of how Israeli public opinion has drifted one way or another, or say what percentage of the population would like to settle? You know, the polls now show a reasonably equitable settlement. Reasonably equitable doesn't solve all the problems, but it's getting there. Would get the support of about one third of the Israeli population, about 32 percent will support what's called the Geneva Accords, which isn't an answer, but certainly gets close to it. Uh, but, uh, you know, those, those findings, they, you know, co- they co-inhabit the same political territory as about 60% would like to expel all the Arabs, including the Arabs from Israel. Uh, and you find the same sort of discrep- the same sort of apparent, though it's not real, apparent contradiction among Palestinians, about 80 percent of whom support the terror attacks, but uh, probably nearly that number would also support a two-state settlement. Uh, so you have you know there's no contradiction between the two. Uh, the you know Israelis will accept the, about a third will accept the Palestinian state, uh, but would be just as happy to get rid of all the Arabs. Uh, and at this point, about eighty percent of Palestinians think that the only way to get their state is through terror tactics. 
So there's no contradiction, I don't think. No, that's fine. Uh, what I'd like to do is, if we would, if you could, I'll get the camera closer and you can maybe uh, describe your uh, practice. Okay. Just uh, carry this. Uh, this is my closest Palestinian friend. I consider him a close friend, period. No qualifications. Uh, Mosa Abu Hesh Hesh. This is when I first met him in 1988 in Palestine with his little son, uh, Irwa. Irwa is actually now just going to be entering college. He took what's called the Taljihi, which is the national exam when you were a senior in high school. He just took it. So here he's two, and now he should be about 17. So let's see, 88 to 2004. Yeah. So it's 16 years, so he's about two here, so he's about 18 or 18, 17 or 18 now. And then this is the picture of Musa in 1995. As you could see, he aged a lot during the Intifada years. Uh, it was a very hard time for him, as for all Palestinians. And this is him about two years, three years ago. Uh, he now works for the Israeli Human Rights Center, Beth Salem. He's a field worker. Uh, this is Musa in 1995 with Nidal, the uh, woman from uh, Beit Sahur, whose daughter is getting married next week to, I think, a Palestinian in Italy. Um, and that's basically it. Okay. Thank you very much sure. for your time. Sure. My pleasure.